Who's ready? Uh, <laughs> okay, Peter. Um, yeah, I wondered, uh, first of all, whether the, the fact that you have the symbiosis grow up is actually due to a kind of malfunction of the system in that it is not using the three boxes but only two of them <laughs> and the public the actual overall public good and so on is not actually being sufficiently uh, uh, injected into the development of regulation and of uh, and the industry um, in f I mean it's actually interesting that in the work we've been doing there is this sort of general, there's always a movement from a kind of innovative, either you can take it on a platform or a product level. The product starts off, it's innovative, hey, what will it do? And it gradually becomes a commodity. And I think that what you're pointing to is the multi-scale version of that, which is that the, this industry, uh, big pharma and so on, is act has actually done that. And it's moved from being innovative and 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 fresh let's say to being a commodity pr production system which is no good anyway i wondered about we've been sort of working with aerospace and uh, you know so you you mentioned ict but i wondered you know whether aerospace has anything to tell us what we know is that um they do they every platform becomes a cash cow but then they have a new platform <laughs> The regulation due to safety is extraordinarily severe in aerospace, um, although not in military. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, a lot of so innovations uh, do do probably come up more because of that, actually. Um, but um, clearly, in the civil aviation, it's got to the point where it's so massive to launch a new platform that uh, it take you know you, the biggest companies have to combine in risk sharing partnerships to make it happen um so anyway it, it's it's the thought the point the other point is that under a sort of environmental pressures which have suddenly turned up an oil price which even although it's gone down we know it will go up again um the aerospace people have sort of said oh well you will see a lot of innovation coming through quicker than you think under that pressure so it's sort of interesting that they feel that they could change things at the right time so to speak whereas the picture you're painting is not the same for pharmaceuticals so um i think that's probably um yeah i think that's that's my main point okay. yeah thank, thank you peter um I will take just the third slide in your presentation about uh, the three different fields that are interacting in this, uh, or the three different systems that are interacting in this uh, wider ecosystem, government regulation, industry, strategies and knowledge management, and public and stakeholder concerns. Stakeholder concerns. I think that in this image, uh, one of the systems is not really taken really into consideration, which is public and stakeholder concerns. And from what I understand, uh, from what you have described very eloquently, I think, is that uh, the industry itself basically regulates the whole interaction. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the regulators as much as the industry. And, uh, and I'm wondering whether this is sustainable for the future. Um, just that. Thank you. Jeff? Thank you. I, I, uh, I thought that was marvellous, uh, and I cherry-picked a few points that you, you made. Um, at one point you told us that uh, to understand your, your three-box diagram, somebody had to integrate it all in their heads. That's uh, something that we, we would believe as complex system scientists. And the idea that you can take N independently produced models and put them together to make something sensible is at best optimistic in my view. Um, you told us that you would went to see the economists, and apologies to any economists in the audience, but... Uh, um, you know, if you go to the doctor and he says, well, actually, I don't do your stuff, um, uh, that uh, you're, you're not the right kind of human being for me, um, so I don't do that. Uh, I mean, that, that's the failure of a certain kind of economics. I know that, you know, modern economics is different, Santa Fe stuff and so on. But again, it comes back to the system of systems thing. That you say, I, I only know how to do one bit of the system and I can't think of the whole system. So I think that was a very interesting thing. Um, 
I liked, of course, the uh, uh, bioengineering, the black swan, and um, but I agree absolutely that when you say uh, you know big events are not predictable, but you say they are predictable. I agree with that, and of course, as a lot of people said, I I told you so. You know that uh, uh, somebody told me that uh, 2005 they predicted that, um, uh, that Freddie Mac would go bust and so on. Um, so people did know that. And your question was, which is the interesting question: How do we get off the treadmill? That's what we, we don't think about. So that's very interesting. Um, then you had your, your lovely storm in a teacup. Um, I'm sure we all want a copy of that slide, please. Um, and, and you asked again, for within the teacup, where are the tipping points? I think that's a very interesting uh, question, a way to put, to put that. You told about this new brand of chief executive officers. Um, I won't tell you about the new vice chancellor of the Open University. <laughs> forthcoming. Um, you can read that for yourself. Um, but anyway, the, the point here is that, that people are coming from one system into another with what seem to be totally inappropriate models of the microdynamics of how people work and, wh and what they work. So, I mean, Peter, like a lot of us uh, older academics, was uh, bemoaning the fact that we weren't interested in money but only ideas. Only ideas, Peter. Um, <laughs> that, that that world has gone or going. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it really is important in society that we micromanage properly and sensibly in the way that those subsystems uh, c come together. So again, it goes back to my previous point about multi-level systems, which we're extremely bad at understanding. And I had one last thing, um, which is I wrote down here that wh what you say is so obviously right. Why don't policymakers act on it? Okay, Brian? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it is so obviously right. Um, <laughs> think about our previous um, discussions where we had this image of um, knowledge production as uncertain, unpredictable, emergent, uh, confusing, governance struggling to catch up, catch up, governance as a response, regulation as a response, regulation as inadequate, um, technology forcing the issue, and that was the kind of paradigm we're working on. Now we have a different paradigm which is regulation and governance as the structuring force. So suddenly we have regulation as the causal actor, as the agent, if you like, in the situation. So we've changed completely from one um, analysis, which everyone accepted, to another one, which people are accepting. So I'm just wondering if you could reflect on that apparent contradiction in our discussions so far. Secondly, whether if you placed your analysis in a global context... It, and different political cultures, it will still hold. If you talk about China and India, for example, as, comp as competing states in a global bioeconomy, um, where they would benefit from having a different system of innovation that is not so sclerotic, would it not be to their advantage, is it indeed not to their advantage, because they have their own pharma industries, to pursue a different innovation path? So... Mm -hmm. Maybe if you look at it on a global basis, accepting your analysis is not so entrenched as um, you imply, perhaps. Thank you very much. I, I also have a couple of um, comments. Um, I think your, your comment about IT companies and pharma companies, um, this is something that perhaps we need to think more about. <laughs> How can that kind of restructuring of the industry be facilitated? Uh, because it is, it is a matter of very strong coevolutionary dynamics, which we, you know, would be desirable to take place, even though we yeah. cannot um, um, regulate for them. So, what you know, what would the environment look like to to facilitate it? The other. A really worrying thing was about um, lack of innovation and risk aversion. I have been working with pharma companies for a very long time. We did a project on, a, on, on the IT side rather than the R&D side, and exactly the same characteristics came up. Again, um, serious lack of innovation and um, risk um, aversion because part of it is the total failure of strategic approach um, um, to um, certainly in this case to to the R&D 
um, agenda and also this idea of providing, um, how did you put it, health care, I made a note of it here, um, I can't, uh, delivering health care uh, for a profit, not just delivering drugs. Again, this is a new way of, of thinking, thinking much more holistically, actually using a complex systems approach to, to bring to this kind um, of thinking, because it is the radical rethinking that it's going to, in fact, um, take us into, into the future. Now, would you like to respond to this, or would you like to take some comments and then respond, whichever you prefer? In case I forget, I could okay. maybe respond quickly to this interesting bunch of feedback. And, um, you know, Peter, I think, and Alex both mentioned the stakeholder bit in that model being not mentioned much in my yeah. uh, talk. I think one of the reasons for that is that that, that that came out of the work we did on agriculture with GM crops. And... Uh, there, it was the public who drove both the industry and the regulatory strategies in Europe. And, and you know, one of the problems arising from that is that we now have a completely dysfunctional regulatory system for GM crops in Europe. But that's a, that's a moot point. Somebody will want to argue with that one. Um, and, and uh, you know, taking the, the aerospace example, I, I, think, yeah, I think there are a lot of a lot of aspects you could learn from for, from a lot of different industries. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think one of the similarities with aerospace is that you spend years developing mm -hmm. one product. Mm -hmm. And that one product has to work or the company goes bust. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, an aspect of similarity with pharmaceuticals. I think what I was trying to highlight with IT was what can happen in a different industry sector where you've got different dynamics. Um, and I think as regards the, the stakeholder aspects again, um, I think that the public and the patient groups are becoming much more influential on, on the drug industry uh, and, and healthcare sector in general. Uh, but the general public has not yet become involved in, in, in a serious way with, with medical developments. And, and, and partly I, I think... I, I mean, I know one of the, I think it was Greenpeace, one of the environmental groups, started to try to generate a campaign against high-tech uh, healthcare and saying, you know, a bit like the organic farming, we need to go back to thinking more about natural approaches to improving one's health, like diet, better sanitation, things like that. If you put all that money into these things, you could have an, a similar impact on healthcare. And there's a, an element of truth in that. But they they couldn't make it happen in the health area because because of the patient groups who immediately responded saying, how dare you say we shouldn't have this technology that could save our lives? Mm. So you've got a different dynamic in the stakeholder box for healthcare than, than you had with agriculture, and I think that's, that's quite important. Um, yes, the, the, the how do we get off the treadmill, uh, which, which Jeff brought up, I, I think, yes, it, it is... It is uh, a big question, and uh, I think it takes the policymakers to have a huge amount of courage, more than I think most of them actually have, to to do that. You know, I I, I think uh, I think it would need pressure from somewhere to 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 help them to do it, and um, you know this 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 change in focus would it would it hold? And Brian's question about would it hold in different political cultures? And, we did think about China and India, and and that was an important part of our relative timing of events because we thought that India and China could be the major beneficiaries of the collapse of big pharma in America and Europe um, because they can actually do their own thing. They've got big enough populations they can reinvent and they're imaginative enough to do it, a different kind of regulatory system. However, we also know that they're currently doing their level best to align themselves with our regulatory systems in Europe and America. And so it all depends when the collapse comes. If the collapse comes soon enough, before they're hopelessly hooked in to European and American regulatory systems, then they'll have the freedom to do what they want to do. If the collapse comes later, then, you know, they'll get caught up in the collapse, I think. So, yeah, and... Uh, 
what was it? What was your point? Uh, oh, about facilitated coevolution. Yes. Um, but in order, because there is has to be a fundamental restructuring of yes. the entire industry, and also an innovation and risk aversion, and the failure of strategic. That's right. Yes. Well, I, I think I would agree with all of those, and and the, the need for a new way of thinking, and and uh, and and our our thinking about how this would happen in the scenario we developed here was that you would have these two completely maverick CEOs in two big companies, and they do exist, um, who, who would actually decide to go it alone and do something different. Whether they'd be able to take their shareholders along with them is maybe another question. But there's, a, there's another way for this to happen, and it, it could actually all gradually lean over slowly and then evolve to something more yeah. horizontal. Yeah. Um, if you actually gradually open up the opportunities mm. for smaller companies, yeah. And a, a lot of the small-scale regulatory innovations that are happening kind of piecemeal at the moment could conceivably add up to something that will be big enough to have a fundamental change. So um, it, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that you could get that happening. Okay, so we now open it to the floor. Um, yeah. So um, microphone. Again, if you can remind, just mention again who you are and where you're from, please. I'm Jean Bolton, and um, I work with uh, with Peter at Cranfield some of the time. Um, I, it, it's I feel rather despondent um, when I um, when I hear hear this because the, the the managed evolution sounds you know sounds so fantastic, but it seems so unlikely. And um, I, I, just, I just wondered what well a what do you think the probability the possibility of that happening is and and B, whether what what could trigger it, yeah. you know, other other than a, a complete new regulatory yeah. um, framework, which seems highly unlikely. Is there, is there something else that yeah. might, might just trigger the change? I, yes. Okay, I mean, shall I we take a few okay. before you respond? Yeah. I think that might be. Um, sorry. Sorry. Yes, there's um, Peter at the front, and so if you take it to the lady back there, then Peter. I too was charmed by, the, sorry, Hilary Rose, I'm a, a, a here at Bios, or nearly here at Bios. Um, of course, I too was attracted to the managed evolution um, model, but I think there are so many difficulties in it. Um, and also, I would happily, Joyce, remind you, I used to work with WHO in the 80s, and our plan there, and a lot of our thinking was profoundly wrong, uh, far too much focus on lifestyles and diet, not adequate attention paid, for example, the absolute necessity for a healthy population for decent housing, something conspicuously in short supply. Um, secondly, the notion that live longer, work longer. If you've got what is what's popularly called, I know some disagree with it, the McDonaldization of work, doing your job, Joyce, is interesting. For many people... For good reason, they can't wait to get out of it. So I think there's some sort of, you know, there's, you know, you've started opening a can of worms, but you have too many bits that you're relying on as if they are okay when they're not. I mean, I've done a bit of work on patient groups. There's plenty more out there. They're mostly massively manipulated by big pharma. So, for example, when the genetics program was being run in the in the um, European bar Parliament, people who would like to have opposed that said, the sight of men with suits pushing devious, grievously disabled people around silenced them. And they could not have a critical and honest discussion. That was the men in suits. And we know what, you know, we know who paid for the suits. So I think there's a lot more tough problems sitting around underneath, which, you know, your managed evolution story is, um, gets a bit like a fairy story to me. We'll take one more, and then I'll give you the opportunity to respond. Yeah. Peter was next. No, Peter at the front. Hello, Peter Taylor. Uh, the question I had was, thinking about this problem as you described it, it sounded, if you think about complex systems in this area, that the one thing that wouldn't happen would be a managed evolution scenario. What's more likely to happen is either through a fundamental technical, uh, technological change in this area, or more likely, probably a political one, maybe with China particularly, in their investment in this, that you'd actually get a dislocation that would rewrite the rule book. 
And when you rewrite the rule book in this area, once these products start becoming effective, then I'm afraid this uh, you know, um, construction of the future being a continuation of the past would just not apply. Thank you. So if you'd like to respond to those, yes. and then we'll take three more. Okay, well, I, I think they, they actually <laughs> all boil down to the notion that the managed evolution mm. is unlikely to happen. And uh, I, I think I would agree with that. And I, I think it's, it's, it's getting more unlikely by the day, as I think the pressures on the industry will be building up because of the financial problems that are going to, I think are going to leak over mm. into pharmaceutical companies as well. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the answer I gave to your question was maybe relevant here, that, that you may get a gradual toppling of the edifice, which will end up being more horizontal uh, and, and uh, end, end up in a way that, that has more space for more different companies. And I, but I do think there's, um, there's an encouraging will, willingness in a lot of people in the pharmaceutical industry to face up to this problem at the senior levels in, in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, I've, I gave an early version, a very early version of this talk at a conference in America, which was mainly pharmaceutical companies. And it was very disconcerting because one third of the audience was nodding and smiling, and the other two thirds were clearly furious. And... Um, the, the, the two thirds who were furious were the lower and middle managers in the industry, and the ones who were nodding and smiling were the senior guys who knew perfectly well that this was what was going on, but the others didn't want to hear about it. So um, I, I think there is a recognition that it's like that. And in fact, we had um, a meeting earlier this year with the vice presidents for regulatory affairs for for three of the big pharmaceutical multinationals, and they gave us more or less a day of their time. And they listened to what we had to say, and, and they said, your diagnosis is spot on. Now tell us what we do about it. <laughs> and uh, I, I, so I think there is an understanding that, that this is a problem, and of the nature of the problem, and a willingness to think about what to do about it. And we are actually now beginning to talk to some of them. And I, I don't think an academic could come up with the answer to that question. I think the answer has to come from within the industry and the regulatory community. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they are ever going to voluntarily get together around a table unless you, unless you provide a very protected space yep. um, and, and get the discussions going in a very kind of private protected space yep. to begin with. And, and that's what we're hoping yes. we'll be able to do. So, yeah, I, I think rewriting the rule book is pretty unlikely. China may be able to do it. I, I think that point about whether the, the timing <coughs> of the serious storm is, is crucial here and it depends on whether China and India who are currently following Western models of regulatory development are, are actually going to be able to uh, develop their own go their own way with this Mark Swisson I work with Peter at Cranfield um, I wanted to to pick up on this word, managed evolution. They don't go together. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can manage change, and that's what you're arguing for. You're not managing, asking for managed evolution. There's, if the system's going to evolve, it needs to evolve, it will do it despite what you do. It will find its own way around. Yes, sooner or later as uh, the city found out recently. <laughs> OK. Can, can I answer that one first? OK. Yeah, Bec because I think, I think that's quite fundamental. I, yes, and I'm not suggesting that you actually manage the evolution, but evolution happens based on variation. And, and so I think what I'm suggesting is we need to inject some variety into these systems, mm -hmm. and then we can watch the evolution happen. But I think... I, I think you can actually envisage different kinds of futures and do make policy or other innovation, mm -hmm. policy or other interventions that will open up the space to these alternative futures in constructive ways. I do think you can be constructive about them. There were a few people who did envisage the World Wide Web, but 
but none Mark, of them were in policy. Sorry. Please. But, but none of them were in policy or in the companies concerned, BT or anybody like that. Nobody saw what was going well, to happen that, with the I think that's exactly the point I'm making. had before that. If I you, don't see how we can say, oh, well, what we want is this kind of little, little bits here because what's going to happen is something radical from outside. Yeah, but I think we can say we want something that's more innovative and open up the possibility to more innovations like the World Wide Web. And I'm not saying we can predict, we definitely can't predict what will come out of this in terms of technology. But we can, through policy interventions, create a more supportive environment within which that technology yes. can evolve. That's just a, lingu a linguistic adaptation. It's what you're wanting is unnatural selection. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, before, before, <laughs> sorry, Alec, there was someone there before, and you can have the, the next Hello. one. Um, I, I, I was uh, Who are pa you? My, Michael Hopkins from Sprue. Um, I, I hope I'm not reiterating the point that was made by um, one or possibly two of the panelists about neglecting the public. Um, but, but isn't the, the real point here in um, trying to achieve regulatory change that the regulatory system is there to protect people? Um, from products that perhaps shouldn't be wide, made widely available um, until they are shown to be uh, more safe and that uh, policy makers will uh, prioritise that above all else and therefore you will hit a, a brick wall with regulatory change there. Um, Alec Robertson, uh, design again. Um, yeah, w one complexity scientist, which uh, you probably know, is George Rovetsky, and he's advising people who design artefacts like uh, planes and ships uh, that designers shouldn't try and predict and design a single model that might work or not work, as the Airbus might or may not, but design adaptability into it because it will then be self uh, be resilient and adapt. Um, maybe this... Uh, Adaptability concept is uh, everything's an artifact. You know, health services is an artifact. Where the adaptability, if it's built in, would act in a similar way and uh, adjust itself, not trying to determine it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Aurora? Yes, if someone is Hold on. Yes, um, actually linking up some of the points which have just been made here um, to get with, um, with Brian's point earlier on. Um, I'm, there are two, two things really that, that strike me. Um, I, I, was, I was at this conference in Vancouver three weeks ago where um, one of the leading pharmaceutical, um, you know, kind of big people uh, from Marx was uh, giving a talk on business failure as being, you know, the prevalent model in the pharmaceutical industry. And he just gave us you know, 30 slides on how uh, this, the current model actually is one of failure. Nine out of 10 companies will go bust. Only one <laughs> will, you know, prevail. And he gave us, you know, details on the rates, you know, failure and, 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 um, and but, but the thing that, uh, you know, strikes me now retrospectively is that he didn't mention regulation as one of the causes of the failure. This was not, you know, clearly one, what he, you know, one of what he thought, you know, was one of the drivers. And, and then, you know, that makes me th wonder how that si this sits in with, with the, you know, with, with the, the models you've given us here. And, 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 you know, related to this then uh, is Brian's point about, um, you know, what, what's, you know, the role that... Uh, you seem to be ascribing to, to regulation, you know, within this paradigm as a driving force, um, which, I mean, I, I think I would, I think, you know, like Brian, I mean, I think to think that looking at the EU as the uh, current driver for regulation in these spheres, because let's face it, you know, the, all the new um, regulatory controls on advanced therapies, on, um, you know, tissues, on cells, all that's come from the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it's actually been, in, you know, all these regulations were introduced very much to tie up now with the previous speaker's point, uh, um, in re in a, in, as a response to concerns <laughs> that the public, you know, health and safety were at risk, <laughs> uh, that there were technologies which were actually being, you know, applied and uh, without any proper framework to ensure that patients were going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And so the main kind of, you know, uh, driver behind the introduction of all these regulations was to protect the public. Uh, now, in so doing, it may, so, so, you know, the, the regulation is introduced 
in a reactive kind of, uh, you know, uh, as a reactive force there. Uh, and, uh, and, and then he indeed could potentially stifle innovation further downstream. But, you know, that's the origin of the, of the regulation. I wasn't clear from what you said where you thought the driver for the regulation you now came from. Yes. Um, Sorry. Was that related to the current point, or would you like to go to the next points. cluster? Yes. Hmm? Okay. Shall okay. We one more. Yeah. Ben Sykes, UK National Stem Cell Network. Um, for the regen medicine industry, which of course includes um, stem cells, regulation is not the particular problem right now. It's purely finance. Of the 15 or 16 small companies in the fledgling UK regen medicine sector, um, only four will survive the next year, probably. Uh, the rest of them have about you know, less than 12 months funding left from their venture capitalists um, to support their preclinical work and phase one clinical trials. So, so right now, the big concern uh, for the regen medicine sector is, is purely finance. Okay. Um, the, 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 the two points, I think, about protecting the public, um, I, I think it's very valid, and I, I did slip over it rather quickly to say we're not suggesting that there's any uh, relaxation of the safety requirements unless in cases where people actually want to take more risk. And I think there, there is a case could be made for opening up the system a little bit to allow certain groups of patients who would be perfectly happy to take the risk, even on an altruistic basis, to provide benefits for future patients. I think that should be allowed to a greater extent than it is at the moment. But, but I do think that the, the current regulatory system, based as it is on double-blind clinical trials with vast numbers of patients in many cases, could be a whole lot smarter and could still deliver safety. And it's a very 20th century regulatory model which doesn't match the really innovative scientific opportunities we're bringing forward now. And what we need to do is think, think much more widely about how you could still deliver safety, but do it within a system that didn't act in quite such a restrictive way on, on the innovation. And I'm, and I'm not saying regulation always stifles innovation, because smart regulation very effectively opens up opportunities for innovation. And uh, actually, we, I mean, we, we've written about it in other areas, but uh, one of the projects that was very formative in these, this thinking was a, an EC project on policy influences on technology for agriculture, where we were asking big multinational companies developing pesticides and GM crops what, how their strategy interacted with, with regulation. And um, most of them couldn't think of anything to say when we asked that question. They just said, well, regulation, it's there. You tell us what to do and we'll do it. We just want to know what you want us to do in the case of GM crops. And they, it, it, was, it was quite a while and quite a long way into an interview when somebody said, hang on a minute, I see what you're talking about, and gave us an example of the American... Uh, Food Quality Protection Act, which had on its way through Congress, um, quite accidentally apparently, because we couldn't find anybody who had expected this to happen, um, set up a fast track for any pesticide that was um, safer or in the environment or for people than what was currently on the market. And um, the, the impact of that fast track was that very soon the regulatory pipeline was full of products that were better and safer than what was already on the market. And it acted very fast and very effectively to create an opportunity for innovation. And, and so regulation can do that very effectively if you get the right kind of regulatory stimulus. And that's really what we're talking about, is getting the right regulatory Absolutely. stimulus. So um, now, um, I, I think what Ben was talking about regulation and finance, and um, yeah, this, this also, it, the, the regulatory impact on stem cell developments is something we, we've written about in other areas. And um, I, I, think, I think you're, you're right that um, 
Well, no, I think you're not right, actually, that, that regulation's not a problem. I mean, we, we talk to people who've, uh, who are running small companies involved in stem cell development, and talking to them three or four years ago, uh, most of them saw themselves as being in the, in the business of uh, developing regenerative medicine solutions to disease problems. And they have now all switched. Every single company we talk to has said, that is so far in the future, we can't plan for it. And the reason it's so far in the future is because of the regulatory system that's being introduced in Europe and the States, if it comes on soon, uh, using the double-blind clinical trial model uh, as a basis for choosing, for determining the safety of what is actually basically a surgical procedure. And I'm not sure that's the best way to regulate a surgical procedure. I think there are probably better ways to determine safety than that. And ways that won't actually lead to such a long time delay. And the reason the investors are not investing is they can see this regulatory hurdle being set up for these companies. And they don't need to do very many calculations on the back of an envelope to know that these companies are never going to be able to develop um, a, a therapeutic product for, the, for a viable amount of money that they might inject into this. And therefore, the only people who can develop stem cell therapies are going to be the pharmaceutical companies. And they're not going to want to do that, no matter what they may say just now. It's going to conflict with their drug markets, for one thing. Um, and it's going to be such a path-breaking innovation in terms of how you develop the product, how you deliver it to patients and everything else. It doesn't fit with their models. So I, I think it's very unlikely. And I think that's why they're, they're not getting investment. Did you want to respond to that? Because <coughs> okay, quick response. So. Hold on, hold on. And that will be, our, I'm afraid, our last. Um. Big Pharma is a bit different from the small companies. GSK has just teamed up with the California Institute of Regen Medicine to, to fund a program in stem cell science. Pfizer, um, the big fish in the pond, if you like, has, has just invested in uh, a major centre at Cambridge Science Park, which includes a program specifically on, on, on stem cells and stem cell therapies. And, and that is a huge shot in the arm for um, Big Pharma and the, the smaller companies in regen medicine in, in, in the UK. So I think that they are investing. The regulation is co-evolving with the science. Um, it's got to be different from the previous um, drug-based regulatory framework. And, and I think those, those obstacles right now are more or less important than, than the immediate, immediacy of finance to, to the companies. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Right. In that case, please again join me to thank Joyce. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.